Well, hello and welcome back to another thrilling episode of The Andrew Eborn Show. And what I love on this show are our regulars. And we're joined again by Dawn Barry and Martin Williamson. How are you both? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, there you go. And you've worked out at what each other's name is now, which is glorious. It was last time. Last time. Uh, a little bit of confusion, in the, but we did work out the common element, the common thread was Dawn's wonderful mother. And uh, uh, lovely knowing about that. And talking about celebrating things. At the moment, Blythe Spirit has rightly had the spotlight shot on it again uh, with Dame Judy Dent. She's always wonderful in everything she does, even if she does the most extraordinary things. And the critics are not very kind about Blythe Spirit in the same way as they weren't very kind or maybe a little bit honest about cats. They seem to have it this time of year. But Dame Judy Dench is always a delight. And uh, Dawn was telling me just beforehand, she says, you know, Martin does Noel Coward. And it sounded like <laughs> Debbie does Dallas. And I thought that doesn't sound right. <laughs> 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 and I thought, yes, I know. He does a wonderful, wonderful Noel Coward. Um, tell me, Martin, why is Noel Coward so important? Well, it was he, he sort of appeared to me one day because I, um, I, I bought a CD of his songs and I thought, what a really unusual voice. It took me a while to get used to it and think, did he really sound like that? So I started doing a lot of research about this man. I was trying to try and make some more work for myself. So I thought, why don't I try and impersonate Noel Cad? I mean, I'd always seen him as a child growing up when they showed repeats of the Italian job with uh, Michael Caine, where he played Mr. Bridger. And I thought he had such an unusual voice. And I actually uh, came across um, somebody who was related to him. And I got to the bottom of why he spoke in that very, very, very peculiar way. And apparently it was because his mother, um, Violet, was very hard of hearing. So he would speak and articulate every single syllable of every single word. And that's why, and he, he actually took that into the way he performed his songs and his plays. It was all very precise, uh, very stylized. He really was his own creation. He came from a very humble background. So, and that, that was all because of his mother being hard of hearing. Apparently so. And then, and then he took it forward into the way he performed. So, yeah. And he's also in the news that not just a blithe spirit, but last week, uh, in an auction house, one of his, some of his photographs were sold for the princely sum of £1,600. Um, but they're a little bit saucy, these photographs, and he would have, um, he would have been arrested uh, at the time if they had been public. <laughs> well, it's funny because my, my, my aunt on my, my uh, mother's side, an aunt of mine, she, um, her grandfather was a theatre manager in London back in the 20s and 30s, and he knew Noel Coward very well. And he said, but he used to get up to all sorts of dreadful things in his dressing room, which oh. he would never discuss. But he said things used to go on in the dressing room that they, they had to keep behind closed doors. Is that right? Um, and what sort of things went on in the dressing room? Well, I think I'll leave that to your imagination. Well, my imagination is far too let's say thing, Things that were probably illegal pre-1967 went on in those dressing rooms. But there we are. Well, I think he, um, he would have been quite proud, wasn't he? I mean, he was out well, he, there, he, he? he was. He never, uh, Noel Coward never hid his sexuality. He was so confident within himself. I think his mother really gave him that confidence. I mean, he was very close with his father. His father was always described as a bit of a, a, a down-on-his-luck piano tuner. So they, they, he said he grew up in sort of genteel poverty. That's what Noel Coward said. He said, so he, he said, we never, we never heard the sound of carriage wheels on the gravel drive because we never had a drive. So it was just a <laughs> terrace house in Teddington he grew up in, but uh, he was an extraordinary man. He was, um, but not only an extraordinary man, a fantastic writer. What are oh, some of your favorite pieces? Uh, one of my favorite pieces was a rhyming verse he wrote. There was a piano accompaniment and it was called, I've been to a marvelous party. Oh, I love that. Are you going to do that for us now? I'll do a bit of it. I'll see how much of it I can remember, shall I? <laughs> go, go all up here, whizzing round still, you know. So I'll have a go. Here we go then. So he said, quite for no reason, I'm here for the season and high as a kite, living in error with Maud at Cap Ferra, which couldn't be right. Everyone's here, frightfully gay. Nobody cares what people say. Now, though the Riviera is really much queerer than Rome at its height, on Wednesday night, I went to a marvellous party with Nunu and Nada and Nell. It was in the fresh air and we went as we were and we stayed as we were, which was hell. Poor Grace started singing at midnight and she didn't stop singing till four, but we knew the excitement was bound to begin when Laura got blind on the Bonnet engine and scratched a veneer with a Cartier pin. I couldn't have liked it more. I've been to a marvellous party. 
Hey, I love it. There you go. And you know what, all wonderful. Now, but there we are. <laughs> and, and I think it's probably he could have said that daily, couldn't he? He was part oh, absolutely. of the parties. But he was very clear. And actually, you can go on YouTube and look up when he went to Los Angeles, when he went to America, sorry, in 1955 and, and opened a cabaret act because he had hardly any money left. And eventually he made enough money because he was he was performing in Marlena Dietrich's club in London, the Cafe de Paris. And he was being paid £750 a week, which he thought was wonderful, it's money. His friends thought it was a derisory sum. And one night, an American chap came into his dressing room and said, Mr. Carrard, we want you to come out to Las Vegas. We, we think they'll love you there. And Noel Carrard was like, well, I, I, I really don't think they're going to understand my humour. He said, well, let me put it this way. We'll pay you a $30,000 a week. He went, I'll do it. I don't care <laughs> if you throw at me, I shall do it. And he did. And he became so successful financially that he had to leave his beloved Great Britain. He sold up his farm in Kent, Goldenhurst Manor, which is now the home of Julian Clary, and he sold his townhouse in Belgravia, and he bought a chalet in Switzerland, which he wanted to call Shilly Chalet, and he bought um, a little bungalow out in, um, where was it, um, Jamaica, which is where he died. And, uh, used to, and even the Queen Mother was entertained there. She just went there one day and the, everybody was panicking because the Queen Mother said, oh, just call all the engagements off. I'm going to go and see Noel for the afternoon. And so the Queen Mother disappeared and they were panicking all over Jamaica. And she was found at Noel Coward's house with her feet up, having a gin and tonic or something, having a right laugh with Noel Coward. So there we go. And that's what I loved about Noel Coward. There are many of those sort of stories where people just felt so relaxed to yeah. be themselves, didn't they? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And considering he was from such a humble background, um, I mean, he, luckily he, he he became friends with somebody called a very young Earl aristocrat who died very young, unfortunately, the Earl of Latham. And um, I think Noel Cowd would not have been Noel Cowd had it not been from the Earl of Latham, who actually financed a lot of his early uh, productions and everything. So I think Noel Cowd took full advantage, let me say, True. of the association with that wealthy aristocrat. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, well, Martin, I, I just want to ask. Yeah. I just want to ask. I, well, I'd like to ask Martin something actually. Do you draw very much from um, Noel Coward yourself with the things that you do? Ooh, I don't know really. I mean, the thing is, it's, uh, I, I always think you're, it, uh, Noel Coward and Oscar Wilde both thought that their life, their lives, were a work of art in progress. It might sound a bit pretentious, but I suppose I'm still on the way to finding who I am because half the time I just like to hide away and not be seen, believe it or not. Um, so I can entertain when I have to, but then I like to go and hide away. And I don't think Noel Cab was like that. Although, whenever he had a success, he would just um, go off on his own, on solitary trips all around the world. He'd go as far, even if he had a success or a failure, he'd just travel away. So um, I think there are aspects of me that I like to think maybe I've got from him or been inspired by him. I think the fact he was his own creation he didn't play by any rule book. He he went as far as he could, really, because in his mind he went there. And in much later life, he was interviewed by an Oxford Cambridge um, journalist and who was quite critical of Noel Cad and his, what he'd done. And Noel Cad said, well, um, he said, I'm taking it you went to Oxford or Cambridge. And he went, yes, I did, actually. And he said, well, that is why um, I am where I am, because I didn't go there. I didn't have I didn't have that channeled educational mm. route. I just went out there and thought, well, I'm going to try this, try this, see where it leads. Whereas you went to Oxford and Cambridge, have this glittering education, and yet you are the interviewer and I am the interviewee. So I think that was quite telling. The fact that Wonderful. if you go there in your mind, you'll go there. You know, he was just very confident, very nervous as well. Yet he, well, I, I, you, you, tend, you tend to find that, don't you? I think sometimes the people who are the most confident, actually deep inside, they're quite tortured. I think he was actually because he had several nervous breakdowns and he aged very quickly. If you see photographs of him as a very young man, about 1920, when he was around 20 years old, he's very good looking. You know, he's got the slicked hair and much slimmer than me. I, I porked out. I'm going to be Oscar Wilde as I get into my 40s, you see. And, um, <laughs> but he, he, um, he aged very quickly. By 1930, when he'd written Private Lives for him and Gertrude Lawrence, he had lines on his forehead, his hair was thinning quite rapidly. So he worked incredibly hard. And I think he literally lived on adrenaline for many, many years. Um, he made it to 73, so that's not oh, no, too... So 73 is not too bad at all, but, no, but, and, but nowadays people are living a lot longer. But you yeah. do find that the most out there people are the people who are the most tortured inside. And so yeah. it happens uh, with comedians, doesn't it, as well? Well, there was uh, the comedian Dick Emery. I mean, I love Dick Emery. I know he's very saucy, very old fashioned, very un PC, but my God, he was funny. And, um, you know, oh, you are awful, but I like you. And um, 
he was deeply tortured, very successful. I mean, he had the highest ratings for decades, you know, but a very tortured man. He had no self-esteem, no confidence. And yet he was such a gifted uh, mimic and comedian. No. Well, there are either, there are either so many, I think, very talented individuals and certainly very creative individuals tend to overthink an awful lot of things, which is how they create such marvel, marvellous things to start with. Yeah. So it may not even be a lack of confidence, but it could certainly be things like, uh, you know, the great big sort of the, the dark clouds that descend. I know of many very talented people who suffer with depression mm. really quite badly. Um, and that's a great, great shame because obviously to be creative, you've got to seek within as well in the first place yeah. to, to get the creativity out. Um, and, you know, when you think of people like Benny Hill, a very tortured individual, um, uh, gosh, what was his name? Um, Oh, it's gone for me right now. But anyway, Peter Sellers. Oh yes, another absolutely. Mike Milligan was the same before that. You had George Sanders, uh, yes. the voice of uh, um, uh, uh, in, in that sort of stuff as well, uh, and and everything in the Jungle Book. And what happens is, I think they have this sort of public persona that the, the brighter you are, they're sort of you're like a minstrel if you like. You've got this hard exterior, but inside it's all a little bit squishy, isn't it? Absolutely. Definitely. And, and I think that's what happens. And, and, and lots of that, Tony Hancock, many yeah. comedians ha are tortured inside. And I, I love think, Frankie uh, Howard. I think Noel Coward, I think the true Noel Coward. And yeah. it's interesting hearing why he developed that extraordinary voice uh, because yeah. of his mother being hard of hearing. I think that's wonderful. But also, I do think he wanted to be loved. And his, his little bit about the Oxford Cambridge uh, interviewer, I think you're right. He felt a bit insecure in himself, yeah. but had to sort yeah. of point out, look, hang about, I'm sitting here you're sitting there um, absolutely yeah to himself but he was probably his own worst critic wasn't he i think he probably was yes i mean he, i don't think he read much criticism he'd hear a little bit of it and he thought i don't want to know if they've loved it that's great if they hate it i'd rather not know or just not read any of it so he'd just travel away on his own he'd just disappear yeah. from month it, is, it is i mean I, i'm talking about george sanders and uh, the oh, voice of sheer uh, in, in that sort of and, and with you need to shine a spotlight on these people so people don't forget just how brilliant no, and they George were. Sanders had the most wonderful voice and he was such a sardonic cad wasn't he in these old 40s and 50s and 60s films and um yes I think he was he didn't want to get beyond a certain age and he left a suicide note saying I am leaving this sweet cesspool called the world behind with her own you know with her troubles she can get on with it you know and I, he wasn't that old I think 66? He, he was no age at all. And, and what happened as well is that he hated, hated Hollywood. He hated all the glitz and all the artificial yeah. stuff. David Niven. David Niven couldn't stand it. He said it's nothing to write about, which is why he lived in the south of France. And his first wife, who was his true sweetheart, David Niven, she died in Hollywood. And they were doing a, 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 a hide and seek party and she opened a door thinking it was a closet and fell backwards down the stairs yes. in the cellar. Yeah. I mean, it's tragic. He was wonderful, David Niven. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. brilliant. And, uh, great, great writer as well. Oh. Uh, and mm. raconteur. He was fantastic. I don't know if you've ever seen him on any of the um, the old interviews that you occasionally get on a Sunday on BBC oh, Two. No. Uh, yeah, on Parkinson's show. Uh, he's fantastic. Well, Parkinson's an amazing interviewer to start with. Just lets all his guests ramble and ramble and ramble until they they sort of they, he gives them so much rope they hang themselves on it. Um, <laughs> and 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 as a viewer, when you watch it, you just can't help but fall in love with the majority or go away disliking some of them, <laughs> but the majority of the guests. But David Niven was one that uh, he was just superb, absolutely mm -hmm. superb. Mm -hmm. He was the moon's a balloon, fantastic. Indeed, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the book after that as well. He was a great writer and a good observationalist. Yeah, no, fantastic. Uh, Dawn and uh, Martin, thank you so much for joining thank me you. again. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So thank you again to Dawn and to Martin for being my guests today. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, write to me, Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV. Dot com. That's Andrew Eborn at OctopusTV.com. Uh, don't forget to follow on Twitter at OctopusTV at Andrew Eborn. And you can subscribe. Do it now. And it's free on YouTube and other platforms. Um, but for me, for now, thanks so much for being my guests. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.